Welcome to Sexology, a podcast that untangles the science of sex and pleasure. And now, with this week's episode, your host, clinical psychologist, Dr. Nazanin Moali. Hello there. Welcome to another episode of Sexology Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Nazanin Moali. Today, we're going to continue our conversation about non-monogamous relationships and alternative relationships that people are kind of experiencing and having. And today, we're specifically going to talk about polyamory because this is a relationship structure that many of you guys had question about. If you are a loyal listener, you might remember that in episode 75, we had Sophie. She's an author and she published her memoir of of how she came out as a polyamorous person. And uh, we interviewed her about her experiences. I love this current episode because it is different since we have a, a licensed marriage family therapist and a sex therapist on the show. So we can hear it from the other side, from the therapist and clinician that worked in this area. Before I dive into our episode today, I wanted to remind you guys that this is the last week we are offering our special offer. As you know, in my practice, it's me and two other clinicians. And the offer we're having this month is uh, we're giving 50% off of the second session. The reason that we structure it that way is because the first appointment is kind of meet and greet and intake appointment. So uh, your work wouldn't be start until real work wouldn't start till second session. And if you decide to kind of like, if you have questions about it, if you want to kind of take us on that offer, you can email me at Dr. Moali at Oasis to Care. And based on your area of interest, I'll, I'll pair you with one of our clinicians. Our guest today is Marta Kalpi, licensed marriage family therapist, is an educator ASAC certified sex therapist and supervisor and AMFT approved supervisor. She specializes in relational sex therapy, including alternative family structures and train therapists to work effectively at the intersection of sex issues and relationship challenges. Marta's mission is to make sex a safe topic in therapy rooms everywhere by developing unique educational experiences and immediately applicable learning materials for therapists. Without further ado, here's my interview with Marta Kalpi. Hello and welcome to another episode of Sexology Podcast. I am very excited and honored to have Marta Kalpi on our show today. Marta, welcome to our show. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to talk to you about polyamory. Yes, yes. So last week, one of our psychologists talked about the factors and reasons that people opening up the relationship. And polyamory is one of those interesting relationship dynamics. And I know many of our listeners sent me emails and they're interested to learn more about it. But before we dive into different things related to polyamorous relationship, I'm kind of curious. I know that you're a relational sex therapist. So what are some of the alternative relationship structures that you have worked in your practice with? I've worked with a broad variety of alternative relationship structures. It seems like, you know, there, and then we kind of get into the area of definitions, which is complex and ever shifting. But I've worked with people who are in open relationships, meaning not intended to be romantic, but like friends with benefits other forms of non-monogamy that don't involve an expectation of romance. I've worked with lots and lots of people in poly relationships where I would say the difference there is that there is an expectation that there will be a romantic involvement in addition to a sexual involvement. I've worked with people who are swingers, and that's more of a couple pursuit where um, a couple has sexual interactions with other couples for the purpose of entertaining the couple. So it's not, uh, swinging isn't generally an individual pursuit. And then there are all different sort of subcategories of ways that people structure their relationships. And some of those have names and some of them don't. But I think it's worth mentioning just sort of the sky's the limit in terms of what an open relationship might look like and what a poly relationship might look like. 
And, you know, I love that you're talking about all this variation and what's out there, because sometimes I notice that I, I see clients that they feel kind of stuck. They are in a more kind of traditional setting and it's not working for them and hasn't been working for them for years. So it's great to see that there are different ways of doing relationships. So, and would you say there are like, you? I would imagine you had, you've worked with successful clients and successful couples in all sorts of structures. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's probably the main thing that I'm interested in communicating when I teach about polyamory is that, and when I work with clients for that matter, I want everybody to know it does exist in nature in a healthy form that lasts for a long, long time that's stable, that has high levels of intimacy, good levels of commitment. It actually works. Not for everybody, but I would say that's true of monogamous relationships too. Those don't work for everybody either. So given that we live in a culture where there's nobody saying, actually, I know somebody in a poly relationship that really, really works. I just want to be the one that says, oh yes, this absolutely does work. It's not something to discount out of hand. Right. So I usually just tell my clients, yes, I've seen it. I've seen it lots. I can't say that it's going to work for you, but I can say that it does exist in nature. Right. And uh, you were right when you made the comparison with the traditional kind of more monogamous relationships. I've seen monogamous relationship that long term works and uh, like the rest of us. <laughs> and there are a bunch of other couples that just didn't work out like the passion dies off. So many things that come up. But when I think about different relationship structures, it's interesting that I think polyamory, it appears to be one of the toughest one, at least like based on my personal experience, like working with clients and friends and stuff to make it work. I work with tons of people in non-monogamous relationship, but I feel with polyamory, it's more challenging because there are some emotions and relational component to it as well. Yeah, it's a challenging relationship structure, but it's not an impossible one. And interestingly, I think the same things that make a monogamous relationship work really well also make a poly relationship work really well. That makes sense. So I'm kind of curious, how did you get interested in working in this realm of working with these uh, non-traditional couples? Well, I have family members who are in open relationships. And when I went to school, I was working on my master's degree in marriage and family therapy. I had a really great couples course taught by a very well-known therapist who I really respect and care about. And when I asked about poly relationships, he said, I do work with poly couples sometimes. And it seems that the mother of one or both partners seems to always have a personality disorder. Oh, no. <laughs> 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 and I thought to myself, well, huh, that sounds a little pathologizing and it doesn't actually match what I observe. And so, you know, word kind of gets around in a community when there's a therapist who is able to work with a subculture or a marginalized population with some cultural competence. And I really built my practice, this part of my practice, the practice where I work with poly people by word of mouth in the poly community and in the community of therapists, when somebody doesn't know what to do with it or doesn't feel like they can handle it, they send it to me just because I have some cultural competence there. And so when I teach about polyamory, I'm really interested in helping therapists get that. It's not rocket science. You just have to know a little bit about a marginalized population and have the ability to look inside of yourself and stretch a little bit if it's, if it's a reach for you to work with a relationship structure that somebody else is choosing and that is a valid choice, even if you might not choose it or you might not believe in it. So, and that's true of so much of what we do as therapists. It's so important to separate the client's goals from our own life goals. Right. And as you were talking about this, I was reflecting on the same things that, so for example, we think about clients with depression. And, you know, any, and every single person's depression might appear different. Like it's, it's helpful to show up as a clinician to kind of see what's going on in the room and with clients versus kind of coming in with our preconceived notion. I think part of it, it's kind of hard to not have any kind of like 
uh, recording that we all have, the scripts that we all have, all obviously runs in our head. But as you said, it's important to kind of like kind of do more work as far as seeing if this is working for us and also kind of like tuning in with what's going on in the relationship with the individuals we're working on. You know, it's interesting. I was doing a kind of some background check on you. Like usually I read clients' blogs and publication and things of that sort. And I came across the uh, research you did around finding the emotional intimacy and you compared the traditional monogamous couple and individuals and people in traditional monogamous relationships. Can you tell us a little bit about that research? I can. That's some deep digging you did there because I didn't publish that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm good at that. I know. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, Google lives forever. Uh, you can find my research study on the internet, obviously. What I actually did, I couldn't find anything that used a intimacy measure that I could believe in that measured intimacy in a monogamous relationship, interestingly. So what I did was I used a, an intimacy measure and also collected a bunch of demographics about people in poly relationships. And then I compared primary or relationship of longest duration with secondary or all other relationships. And I make that distinction because not everybody identifies as having a primary and a secondary relationship. So when somebody didn't identify a primary and a secondary relationship, I used as my measure the relationship of longest duration and all other relationships. Because there's this myth, sort of a culturally prevalent idea that we have that if you're in a relationship, so you've got your primary relationship, you're married to somebody or you've got a long-term partner or what have you, and then you decide that you're going to open up the relationship. So you're going to have another relationship with somebody else on the side. There is a cultural belief, sort of a knee-jerk idea that that is going to affect the intimacy in the primary relationship. That once you start having a romantic relationship or a sexual relationship with somebody else, the level of intimacy in your original relationship is going to be diminished. And so that's why I did that comparison. And what I found out was that that is not the case. It would appear that there is a high level of intimacy in those primary and longest duration relationships. And there's a high level of intimacy in the secondary relationships, but there's always a higher level of intimacy in the primary relationship. So I didn't compare how it changes after the secondary relationship starts because it, it wasn't a long enough study to do that. But the levels of intimacy were high enough that I just didn't feel particularly concerned about that. There were high levels of intimacy in all of the relationships. And it's interesting. I love that when I read the review, like the um, discussion and all the founding that uh, you discuss what you uh, found in your study, I think it was fascinating because at times I feel people think love and affection is a limited thing. So if I'm spending it here, there there is less to go around. So it's good to see that there are people that like, even when they're starting the secondary relationship, they still feel emotionally intimate with their primary partner. Yeah. Yeah. One of the other myths I was interested in looking at in that study was the idea that polyamorous relationships really aren't sustainable over the long haul. So I was interested to know how long the relationships lasted. And the there were a whole lot of very, very brief secondary relationships, but the average length of the primary relationships was like 8.3 years, pretty substantial. Oh, wow. And the outlier was 26 years. Oh my God, 26 years in a polyamorous relationship or between the primary uh, couple? That it's not clear from the way that I gathered my data. It's not clear, but definitely one, at least a, a primary relationship lasted 26 years. Oh, so that's such a long time. Yes. It, so obviously having multiple partners does not make it so that your original relationship can't last, you know? Right. And I think it's interesting. One of the things that changed my view of around polyamory, I did this continuing education with someone who like widely published in the area of polyamory. And she was telling about her experiences and that was her lifestyle. And she was sharing with us in a continuing education that she was toward like she was uh, later in her life. And she said, I was sick and I had this tribe of people 
that I was in polyamorous relationship before or currently and they took care of me. And I love that the way that she was talking about the sense of community that she got from it and how much support she got from people that they were part of her life. So I think certainly can have lots of benefits for people if it's a good fit for their personality and their lifestyle. Yeah. And I like that you're mentioning that there are benefits for the people involved, because that's one of the things that it's important to think about if you're working with a couple or if you are in a couple where you're thinking about opening the relationship and one of the partners is a little bit reluctant or worried about it or not interested in doing it. The way that I work with that situation is to challenge both partners, first of all, to show up authentically with what's true for them and also to stretch a little bit in the assumptions that they're making. And one of the assumptions that sometimes somebody who's reluctant to open the relationship is making is that they're, that this is only going to take things away from me. And that just hasn't been my observation at all. I don't see this as a relationship structure that takes anything away from anybody. It more adds. That said, every relationship is so uniquely individual and there are really great relationships out there and there are really bad relationships out there. So You know, you certainly can't make a sweeping statement that all polyamorous relationships work or that the reluctant partner doesn't end up with some losses ever because there are some truly outrageously bad relationships, you know, but there aren't more bad poly relationships than monogamous relationships as far as I can tell. And I don't think there's any reason to think that there would be. In fact, I find this to be a population that really believes in transparency, you know, being honest and open, being authentic, having hard conversations. They might not, might or might not be good at it at the point that I meet them as a therapist, but they're committed to the concept. And that is a pretty big difference between the population that comes to me for work around polyamory and the population that comes to me for work around monogamy. I would say probably a quarter to a third of the monogamous couples that I work with, one or both partners is pretty reluctant communicator and and may in fact be very reluctant about coming to therapy in the first place. So it's kind of delightful to work with a population that believes in therapy, that believes that therapy can help, that believes in building relationship skills, gaining increasing skill in relationships, having hard conversations and being honest. Like to me, that's kind of the ideal client right there. And I don't care what structure relationship they want to make. I love working with that kind of an attitude. And I, I think um, your clients are lucky <laughs> to have you because like talking with many couple, my colleagues are a couple of therapists and they, they have they just they have, so they have so much resistance and hesitation working with alternative couples because they feel it's not healthy or they have their own hesitations in personal life and that's kind of show up and in therapy room so it's wonderful and refreshing to hear that someone's truly kind of think this is a model that that could work for people and it is working for people so i'm kind of curious i guess the next question i have is around the misconception what are some of the misconceptions that many polyamorous couples face in regarding to their relationship choice in terms of what the public might think or some, or their family members or friends might think about their relationships i think some of the really common misconceptions well we already talked about the idea that poly can't last in the long run it's not really sustainable or it destroys intimacy neither of those is true at all that's clear there's a misconception that polyamory is just a fancy way of cheating and It's really not. The difference between polyamory and infidelity is lies and secrecy. Mm -hmm. So, you know, aside from the the damage that's done in a situation with infidelity where somebody's partner goes outside of the relationship, some of the damage is done by the fact that they chose another partner. And a lot of the damage is done by the fact that there wasn't any discussion around it. There were no agreements made. It was a unilateral decision. And then it was hidden. There are often lies built around it in, a, in addition to just deception and hiding and concealment. And that is a whole different thing from somebody who makes a relationship agreement and expects to continue revisiting that agreement and tailoring things as time progresses. You know, transparency is not infidelity. So that's a, that's a cultural misconception. 
I also think there's a misconception that people in poly relationships are afraid of intimacy. And that's another thing that I just haven't seen at all. I think people in poly relationships really enjoy intimacy and that's why they're having multiple relationships. And I think it requires lots of good communication and also kind of looking into your emotions and expressing them. So it's interesting. It's, it seems like an exposure to being more intim- intimate versus kind of avoiding from emotional intimacy. I know that polyamorous relationships might appear differently. Is it all of the polyamorous relationships, like people in the relationship are sexual with each other? So what are some of the kind of like usual structure that you see within that? that community? Not everybody is in a sexual relationship with each other. And they're so let's see, I think the most common relationship structure, certainly in my practice is what I would describe as a V. So if you picture the letter V at the, there are two legs of the V and they're joined at one end and open at the other end, right? So that would be one person who is in a relationship with another person, person B, and in another relationship with person C. And, but person B and person C are not in a relationship with one another. And sometimes those two people, person B and person C, are friends and know each other. Sometimes they don't know each other. Sometimes they like each other. Sometimes they don't. Sometimes everybody hangs out together and has dinner together and takes care of each other when they're sick and sometimes not. If person B and person C are also in a romantic connection with each other, whether sexual or not, then I would describe this more as a triad, which is a family dynamic involving three people. One way that I think about poly relationships is according to where is the decision making body? Like, is it a is it a dyad? Is it a couple that's making the decisions? Ultimately, sometimes that's the case. In a primary secondary V, for instance, where like, let's say James and Alice are in a primary relationship and then Alice has another partner, Diana, and that's a secondary relationship. James and Alice are the decision making body in that primary relationship. Or if the three of them make decisions together, then I would say that's more like a triad, regardless of who's sleeping with whom. So I guess like, is it like three is the kind of common number that you see in a polyamorous relationship or is it, do you, have you seen like people with like, like four or five partner? Is it common? So I guess the disclaimer is I work with tons of non-monogamous couples, but I haven't worked with polyamorous couples. So that's why I'm kind of curious or triads. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, they come in all shapes and sizes. <laughs> <laughs> In my study, the average number of relationships that a person was in was somewhere between two and three, but the outlier was again in the high 20s. So that probably was, you know, somebody who's in 23 relationships is probably in a network, which is like a community situation where people have whatever kinds of relationships they want to have within this community that I, I don't actually know that, but that was the conclusion I came to from that data because 23 relationships is a heck of a lot of relationships to maintain. Fascinating. (laughs) That must be tiring. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. But the average is just, you know, somewhere between two and three. So that said, I see a whole lot of people who are in something like a W or an N where there are two couples, two couples with primary secondary structures that are connected. So, you know, uh, I'm trying to remember the names I just used in that example, James and Alice are in a primary relationship, Diana and Susan are in a primary relationship, and Diana and Alice are in a secondary relationship. So there, you can imagine, if you kind of map this out, you could get quite the map of people who are connected in various ways, some of whom are all sort of communally connected, and some of whom don't, don't really know each other so well. Interesting. And I can imagine that there are some communities, I live in California, I know that there are some communities, it's not going to be like deal breaker for the community, for example, other people, other parents in the school to know that you are in a polyamorous relationship. But I can imagine in part of the country and also other countries, that must be kind of very scary for people to hide this relationship because of fear of the consequences that they might experience, their children might experience. So I think it it is a courageous way of living, I guess. Oh my goodness. Yeah. I live in Wisconsin 
And um, I live in Madison, which is pretty socially liberal, but as a state, it's not a particularly socially liberal state overall. Just down here in the southern part of the state is pretty liberal. But it's a huge state and it's a fairly conservative state. And the people that I work with who are in poly relationships deal a lot with coming out issues and marginalization and making decisions within the polycule or the, you know, the family unit of, of the relationship about who to tell, when to tell, whether to tell, should family members know, then what do we do on vacations? What if you want to go on a vacation with your secondary partner, then you're just dating, but you're not mentioning your primary partner. Like it's just a very, very confusing, messy situation. And it is that way because this is a hugely, tremendously marginalized population. These are people who lose friends and lose family relationships when they come out. Right, right. And it's just so scary that like people, I mean, like as a a general population, many of us have this kind of a rigid way of thinking about how things should be. And, you know, at times people want to kind of force that to others. So, and I think it's wonderful if people are kind of living the life that's kind of working for them and it's fulfilling. I, I'm going to sh- shift the focus a little bit because I know part of our listeners are therapists. And then the research kind of like the uh, Googling <laughs> that I've done, I saw that you use differentiation model. So uh, is that accurate? That's accurate. I primarily use the Couples Institute's developmental model of couple therapy to work from. And I also teach that model. And that's a couple therapy model that uses concepts from attachment, differentiation, and neuroscience all together rather than picking one camp. Mm -hmm. It's a way of integrating kind of all of those things. But I do talk about differentiation a ton. Yes. So if if there are therapists that they want to kind of listen more about and they want to kind of learn more about, how can they work with the couple from a differentiation differentiation model? What are what are would be kind of this like a first steps you recommend? Obviously, this is a huge model and people need to get training at it. But I'm kind of curious, what would be the first few steps that you would recommend? Yeah, well, actually, I think this will be helpful to people who are in poly relationships, too. So I'll start by defining differentiation as I'm using it. The first part is to be able to get settled within yourself and look inside of yourself and figure out what it is that you think, feel, prefer, desire, separate from what anybody else might think or want you to do. And then the second part is to be able to really get grounded sufficiently to just calmly communicate that with somebody else, even if you think that they're going to have a hard time hearing it. And then the third part is being able to get grounded in yourself when somebody else is telling you something that you're very uncomfortable hearing. So these three skills are absolutely crucial to any relationship. You have to be able to figure out what you want. You have to be able to communicate it to somebody else. And you have to be able to hear what they're saying to you, even if you don't particularly like it. And so holding steady for that process, the getting grounded part is also massively important because nobody ever heard anything uncomfortable in a way that was helpful if they couldn't get grounded in themselves and kind of control their emotional reactions a little bit and access some curiosity about somebody else's reality. But here's the key without letting go of their own reality. So sometimes we get thrown off balance because we think if somebody is distressed and they're expressing their distress to us and they're telling us what they want us to do or what they want in our relationship, then that means somehow we have to provide that. But to realize, nope, this is a separate person from me. This person can have their own opinion, their own desires and their own preferences, and I can have different ones and we can still be in a relationship with one another, even though we have differences. So I think just knowing those definitions and thinking about how that applies to any relationship, it's pretty easy to figure out how it applies to working with polyamory. Because in order to have a successful poly relationship, you definitely have to be able to have hard conversations. You have to be able to disagree without either vilifying your partner or giving up on yourself. You have to be able to make good agreements and you're not going to be making good agreements without a certain level of differentiation. You know, people make bad agreements because they don't really make agreements at all 
or because they agree to things that they already know are a real long shot or that they don't even believe in. And that's a breakdown of that first part of differentiation of being able to honestly assess what I actually want and believe in and I'm interested in agreeing to. And then the second part, sharing it. Fascinating. And I think this is something that you can apply to all sorts of like personal growth and kind of like when it comes to family of origin or monogamous relationship and all sorts of relationship to kind of focus on really what you want and what do you desire and not necessarily feeling responsible for someone else's reality. Absolutely. That's what I meant at the very beginning when I said I think the same skills are required for a healthy poly relationship as a healthy monogamous relationship. And as a therapist, I can say it helps when I teach other therapists, the thing they say helps the most is to understand what I mean by differentiation and then to learn some ways of supporting and pushing those growth edges, the ways that people are you know, missing opportunities, for instance, to figure out what they want or missing opportunities to express themselves congruently, or they're not holding steady sufficiently to hear somebody else, or they don't have a clear understanding of the emotional boundaries. Just because you're unhappy doesn't mean that I have to make you happy. I, I might, and that would be great. And that's where some attachment theory comes in because co-regulation is fantastic. It's wonderful if my partner is upset and I can help my partner feel less upset. However, I cannot give up myself in order to do that. And I shouldn't have to give up myself in order to comfort somebody else. And I think that is so important because sometimes what I see is people trying to kind of like make an attempt to make people feel better because they feel they are responsible for other people's emotion and they develop this resentment and frustration toward the other person. So I like that how you are kind of focusing on it's important to kind of like do the, like your own, like making a conscious decision if you're helping other one or not, or whether it's coming from this place of kind of mindfulness versus kind of like feeling obligated to do that. I guess you mentioned co-regulation, which is interesting. Do you feel like the co-regulation is the same in a polyamorous relationships and a kind of monogamous relationship? Because this is a conversation I recently had with the couple's therapist and she was, she was talking about how she was seeing it differently. I'm kind of curious to hear your perspective on that. I'm kind of curious to hear, hear her perspective. <laughs> <laughs> I, I missed that conversation. Co-regulation, how's it different? Let's see. Well, I can say some special ways that co-regulation can be really helpful in an open relationship. And I'm thinking particularly here about working with jealousy. You know, jealousy is something that most people experience in open relationships. Not everybody, but most people do, and which is, I think, a myth too, the idea that if you're really in an open relationship and you're truly a poly person, you're not going to experience jealousy. It's just not the case at all. It's one of the skill sets that a therapist that works with poly just has to have ways to work with jealousy. So there are ways to work with jealousy in terms of self-regulation, absolutely. Holding steady when your partner is with somebody else, checking your assumptions rather than making up stories, finding ways to distract yourself and get your focus back in your own life instead of obsessing about what your partner might or might not be doing. Those are self-regulation. And Self-regulation is of the utmost importance because in adult relationships, we cannot count on our partner to co-regulate for us. It's great if they can, but if they can't, then that's a little too tragic, I, I feel like. I care so much about people feeling good and feeling happy in their lives that self-regulation has to come first because depending on somebody else, for your emotional stability and balance is a really, really shaky construct. So first, self-regulation. Then if the partners are able to achieve a sufficient level of differentiation to have some internal balance and also to be able to access empathy for their partner's perspective, get some curiosity about what things look like from the other side of the fence there, you know, then co-regulation around jealousy is fantastic. And there are some ways to co-regulate that don't even involve being in the same room with one another. Like uh, sending a text saying, I'm thinking about you is a way to co-regulate for a partner who is at home while you're out on a date, you know, to be able to just say, I'm thinking about you. 
and sort of I think of it as sort of sending a little paper airplane their way with a little love note on it. Oh, how sweet. <laughs> you know. Another way to co-regulate is to make a playlist that your partner can listen to when they're feeling a little iffy, you know, when they're struggling with difficult emotions, a playlist of songs that make you think of them so that they can kind of enter into that space of your love together, even when you're not present with them. And these are obviously handy tricks without polyamory. This is good for anybody who experiences jealousy. And it's good for anybody who experiences loneliness, too. And we're kind of talking about object constancy. Can you feel the person's love even when they're not in the room with you? And building that skill in a relationship is pretty crucial to having polyamory work. You have to be able to feel your partner's love even when they're not with you. Otherwise, it's going to be excruciatingly hard to have your partner dating somebody else sometimes. This is fantastic. I didn't think about like helping someone with co-regulation the way that you were talking about, like tangible steps that they can take and kind of like help their partner experience the love and feel the love. I think these are wonderful. I know that you have like lots of great content on your website. You offer trainings and supervision. So if our listeners are interested to learn more about these topics, what would be the best way of reaching out to you? I think going to my website is a good start. Uh, it's www.instituteforrelationalintimacy.com, kind of a mouthful. I offer training for therapists. At, I don't currently offer training for the public, but at some point in the future, I probably will do something for the public about polyamory. And I definitely offer training to therapists about working with a broad variety of sex issues and also about working with poly. So there's there's lots of information about that on my website. I have a 16-week online course with 20 ASEC CEUs that is about working with a broad variety of sex issues. And the 2019 group of that is just about to open for enrollment. So I think when this podcast is published, the enrollment will be underway for that and closing in just a few days. So if anybody's interested in that, they should get in touch with me, obviously, right away. I offer that course once a year at this point. So the 2019 opportunity is now. Excellent. So guys, if you didn't get a chance to write down the uh, website address, I leave it in the show notes. Martha, thank you so much for sharing your experiences with us. It was certainly an honor to have you on our show. Oh, my pleasure. What a pleasure to talk to you about this topic. I hope that it can make a difference in some people's lives. Thank you and have a great day. You too. I hope you enjoyed my conversation with Martha. I certainly learned a lot from this conversation from her. And one, one of the things that I noticed working with clients, or even friends, that one of the reasons that we're struggling in life is our psychological rigidity and inflexibility. We kind of have these expectations that things need to be a certain way. And if it's not working a certain way, then uh, we're kind of keep pushing it and kind of like, which creates so much suffering and frustration. So I think if you are a person that you feel a kind of monogamous relationship didn't work for you for longest time, or kind of like thinking about you want relationship, but you want the format that you are in, the structure is not working for you, polyamory might be a solution for you. Obviously, it's not for everyone. Obviously, it's not something you can decide uh, one day and saying to your primary partner that okay, okay, I'm opening up the marriage or relationship, but it might be worth looking into. Also, I'm still very curious about the topics that you guys want to hear more about. We are over 100 episodes into this podcasting journey and I'm kind of curious what you want to hear more about. A little bit of preview is uh, from next month, I'm releasing two episodes per week because I'm doing this series on different mental illnesses and sex. So stay tuned for that. But other than that, if you are interested in the topic, feel free to shoot me an email at drmoali at oasis.com. I'll talk to you later. Thanks for listening to Sexology Podcast. For more great content, visit www.sexologypodcast.com. Please be advised that information presented on this podcast is not a substitute for seeking help from a licensed mental health provider.